Welcome. This is the March 7th Beehive Production User Call. We have Rod, Andrew, Jan, Chris, and myself, Michael. And let's see, I will throw out some quick updates on ARM64 Beehive. Olivier ran into a bug that DCH reported, and I see that the user space tools haven't landed in the tree on CGIT, so I will be watching that. Uh, before we go too broad on hot topics, uh, on Friday, Chris Yan, myself met with Yurichiro, who has produced the SysUtils BMD project. And Chris, I would love to hear from you how it relates to your work on VM State D. Well, I would say it is a way more advanced version of what I started because uh, he's got like three years ahead of me. I think he started back in 2021 or 2022. I cannot really remember. I think it addresses a whole lot uh, of the things that I started on, which is kind of the summary task of process supervision. And um, he also created a separate new configuration language you froze i think uh yeah. but probably Jan can, can enlighten us on that and oh i was just thinking actually it was my brain i was breathing this time and uh right what else so action going on in language because it abstracts away the difficulties of setting things up he kept the networking configuration completely separate from the configuration of the virtual machine. So he expects users to actually set up networking and bridges via the regular RC uh, configuration pipeline, which is a pro or a con, depending on which we look at it. He has a very simplistic approach to running hook scripts, let's call it, similar to what I did, but um, with, the, with the additional benefits that he actually implemented, what I think previously Rod suggested, that he has one script and he provides all parameters to the script at which stage the script is being called at. So it's like start, stop, or I think restart, if I remember correctly. There is no timeout, however. So if the hook script hangs, if I'm not mistaken, the program might actually... You are mistaken. I'm mistaken. Okay, that's good. Uh, what happens is that if I understand his intention com correctly, the scripts are just reporting not hooks as you or I think of them, but he folds the S in, they become the transitions of a state machine and you can do things on transition or on entry, right. but instead it runs reactively. It does not block or wait for the response right. and he just runs right. spawns at most one per uh, VM and in uh, event at a time. <clears throat> So that means you can basically use it for logging, but you can't use it for anything which uh, is required for correct operation, which sounds at first like a bit big limitation, but his idea is that you shouldn't be doing such things in a nasty little shell script. Instead, he has a proper uh, C API with a list of exported symbols, which right. is and uh, version symbols so that you can know if the uh, shared library in your libxecd is compatible and so you can have a binary plugin mechanism and he has implemented at least two example plugins which are useful one is the uh, hook plugin and the other one handles avahi updates so that we have guests with um VMC enabled are automatically announced as uh, 
multicast DNS uh, services so that if you're on a Mac, uh, they just show up in your network environment and you can go to the final, go to network environment, click on the VM and say, yeah, share screen. And then you can log in with a password. Um, and that was also pretty cool. That's true. That's, um, and these hooks, uh, which become then part of the BMD server process because it's done in C, um, those can not just read, but can also change through the available API, the configuration. So they can read and write the parts of the state which are accessible for the API. So for example, they could add a device, if I understood the symbol names correctly. And the big difference, in my opinion, between BMD and what you started with VM state D is that VM state D is the mechanism to run Beehive reliably as the design. And, but conceptually, it's a state machine wrapped around the implementation, and you have full access to the implementation. Whereas BMD gives you an abstracted view and things, you are not in direct control. You have to go through it. But that allows BMD to apply higher level logic than just running scripts. So for example, with BMD, you do not uh, specify which tab interface to create and so on. Instead, you say this virtual machine should be connected to uh, these bridges. And then it handles the uh, tab creation sets a description on the tab and uh, joins the tab to a bridge. Uh, it also integrates deeply with uh, Grub Beehive because he runs OpenBSD under Beehive. And historically that was because it can't use Beehive load. Uh, and at the time OpenBSD and Beehive did combined didn't have a good UEFI implementation. So for a while, Grub Beehive was the way to boot OpenBSD and a Beehive. And he does it all. He uses Grub to read the guest disk to find out if it has a RAM disk kernel and so on, and then dynamically generates the right uh, Grub command line and device configuration. Uh, at start up time so that uh, OpenBSD can self upgrade under Beehive without having to use UEFI or the uh, operator having to uh, touch the grub configuration. You just leave it to on auto and it will generate the right configuration uh, so that uh, you can use something like sys upgrade on a grub EFI booting. OpenBSD system, hmm. which is complex to get right. He said that it works for him. I have no doubt because he had answers to all the corner cases I've seen over the years. It just uh, ticked them off on a mental list. So uh, he's definitely seen the trains which you can experience there. Mm. So um, the thing is that uh, his scope is clearly defined as a single beehive uh, host. Um, it does not stop you from moving virtual machines around if you've observed his configurations, but there is no support for it. So basically you have to leave the nice ecosystem he has created for a single host beehive which means that now you have to understand what your storage is and so on. He intentionally defined uh, creating the bridges you attach your tabs to as task of your operator. So you do it via rcconf beforehand. And with regards to storage, he also expects you to bring devices or files. So uh, my first idea of using the hooks, for example, to create Z vaults uh, on first start if they don't exist, that does not work with his design, but it would be possible to extend this model with a plugin to uh, make it work. 
Uh, the question is, is, is there any, is it flexible enough so that you could access it? The configuration of the Z vault from the configuration file, I do not know. Ed, he does that, uh, but yeah. So it is an interesting tool to look at if you want to run Beehive uh, in one of the supported configurations. It can probably be extended. The code didn't look too bad. So, uh, but the idea is that you have to extend the tool either via uh, plugins or by sending patches, getting them upstream or forking it. It's not the universally extendable hook runner, like what it appears Chris was aiming for the VM state D. That you could, similar to a jail.conf where you could hook any state transition and define what happens there. You only have the, the state machine and device creation and you can plug arbitrary code in between. It's not really the idea behind, as I understand his code. Any questions for Chris and Jan? I had, I unfortunately missed the first 90 minutes of it, but arrived for the executive summary and I appreciate you giving that at the time. Um, let me check what I wrote as notes. Uh, he also supports accessing the serial console so that you can just do, say, uh, BM DCTL uh, boot, and then you uh, it creates the guest and it immediately attaches CU to the null modem device. So that's nice, and in my opinion, that's for a Unix system which you can configure to use a serial console or system console. That's the way to go uh, instead of VNC because it uses so much less bandwidth and is so much snappier over. Uh, high latency connections than not just having the network latency, but actually having to push a video uh, through the high latency connection. And it also, mean, it also means that you can put it in Tmux or something like that to reattach to it uh, or run the Tmux under Mosh to get the effective latency down. And copy paste. <laughs> and working copy paste in theory there are vnc extensions for that but yeah goodness it hmm. requires deep uh guest integration uh well chris yeah, i'll leave really it crazy. go ahead hmm. so if you see what you can do via remote management for example on a, on a mac it's sometimes so in intuitive that it's unintuitive for example if you use the mac screen sharing code uh, which is initially at least based on VNC, you can take a file and drag and drop it from the remote system's desktop to your folders and so on. Interesting. Uh, or you can decide if you want to have a sync uh, clipboard or a clipboard where you have to basically copy and paste to the remote system, which then means that you can actually copy and paste almost anything you can put into a clipboard on a Mac, which means images, videos, whatever, you can copy hmm. and paste it across the remote connection. Uh, I've got, go ahead, Chris. I have three more things that uh, that I just found in my notes that um, that haven't been mentioned yet. Um, there is no way to do CPU pinning because basically, as I said before, the configuration is abstracting away some of the things that you can do with Beehive. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to use, for example, like with VM state D, you can use the Beehive config file that is actually being used to start the or, or combine your configuration settings with what you want to do with the with the guest. You cannot do, do this uh, with BMD because BMD has this abstracted configuration language. And there's limits to what you can do. There's also uh, Something that Jan identified there is a potential security risk with hooks. Um, uh, that's uh, only a problem when you open and forking. That's only it's a risk of a feature. Jan was collaborating. Chris? Uh, you're breaking up for me. Um, are you still talking? Oh, sorry. Um, I should I should mute myself. I'm sorry. 
No, sorry to. Let me use chat to ask you. Yeah, and Chris, you can post into the document directly. Just make your points. You've been really good about that on recent calls. So uh, the security discussion uh, we had only relates to using the Unix daemon uh, and its Unix socket to allow unprivileged users to manage virtual machines containing hooks. And here the problem is if you have a hook script which is writable by the unprivileged user, the unprivileged user could run a script with uh, root privileges, hmm. uh, but you have to uh, misconfigure it like that. And he wanted to try to mitigate that and consider basically dropping to the owning uh, user and group uh, kind of inverse set UID, uh, set, uh, UID, set GID behavior. And I just mentioned that you have to uh, use f exec ve and f that you can't uh, start and then exec uh, e because otherwise you have a time of check versus time of use race condition but if you do it for a file descriptor which is possible uh, in freebsd then you can uh, avoid this uh, race condition by using the same file descriptor to check ownership before you exec into it and then uh, you use the same file descriptor uh, to uh, fxec ve it so that you can run it. But that's uh, an uncommon just concept to do that you can have unprivileged users on a privileged daemon, which then can run code as their user in response to state transitions. Yeah, okay. Uh, it, it's interesting if you want to use Beehive on your workstation because then you could uh, use it without going through sudo. Uh, you could just instead directly invoke BM uh, DCTL to mm -hmm. change the uh, system state uh, and start and stop guests and then the hooks run as your daily user and not as word. Okay. Any questions for Jan and Chris That's regarding that? An idea, but he hasn't implemented that. Uh, he just mentioned that and said, oh, "Be careful if you try that. Hmm. There be dragons. You're writing the kind of uh, logic error which stays undetected for a decade and then becomes everyone's favorite uh, exploit because it's perfectly reliable." Well. Do jump in with questions. Chris, I welcome you to reach out about collaboration as appropriate. He will be in Taipei for those who celebrate Asia BSDCon. And thank you so, so much for attending that. I'm sorry it wasn't convenient to record it, but um, uh, it, it was just a, 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 a long methodical run through everything he did. So thank you so, so much for that. Andrew, you had a Spanish remote access product that you became certified on. Do you have anything to report relating to that? Um, like I said, we're, get, we're getting it set up and working. I'm actually using it here for my desktop. Um, uh, virtual running on Cable or something, what was the name? Virtual Cable is the company, UDS is, the soft, is their Thank software. Still going to be having some conversations with them about some some bugs we're hitting right now. Well, cool. is um, it and, free and open source in any way, shape, or form, or is it purely a product? Uh, they have a they have repos for it to be open source, but okay. I'm not sure how easy it would be to actually assemble all of those components into a usable system. Okay, got it.
In is fact, it expensive I'm, by whatever metric you use for expensive? It is it is on par with what we were spending with VMware View. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Well no, that's what we were spending, not <clears throat> what there well, will be spelling mm-hmm. spending if you stayed with them, perhaps. Yeah. Okay, cool. Any questions for Andrew relating to that? Um I was gonna say the it, it accepts a number of of uh backend hypervisors already. Okay. So that's nice. And they seem to be willing to work with you know with me to try to get it to where we can uh attached to beehive nice so that's like great said, I'm, I'm in a, i'm interested in, in in getting that right now like i said right now i've got it up and running on proxmox but uh does it have any notion of say cl- uh, uh clipboard sharing and the other sharing we touched on earlier and drag and drop file and transparent amazingness uh, for clip for clipboards, it's using RDP, so you okay. get all the clipboard sharing of RDP. Nice. Okay. Um, it is using if you well if you use RDP. Yeah. There's a whole list of different protocols you can use as well. Spice. But, um, Spice is in there. Okay. Um, okay. It, it's it's using Guacamole for HTML5. If you want to just load up your web browser. Hmm. So there's a few others. Nice. I, well, you are our new resident expert, and I look forward to your future news on that. That's probably a stretch. Yeah, you know a lot more of it, about it than I do. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, do you have anything? I know you're often pressed for time before we jump into some performance questions. Yeah, I cornered you. So uh, we had a lively discussion on uh, benchmarking and profiling, to use some formal terms. And Chris, you have some uh, questions on reasonable testing strategies, perhaps. Now, you say 60 seconds. Is that of storage, of networking, of uptime, of what? And how's your audio doing? Let's see. You're muted at the moment. Okay. Does it work now? Great. Yeah, there you go. So um I've been doing some testing. Um and let's say the results are quite interesting. Uh I've now actually just tested on my AMD, but I um I also started running tests on the Intel, but I have not really worked through those yet. I've started not just taking measurements on the guest, but I also intentionally started taking measurements on the host. So we can actually, you know, contrast the losses that we see by just the virtualization layer. And the peculiarity that I have stumbled upon, which I have absolutely no explanation at the moment, is I was also measuring latency and particularly for vert IO block, I'm sometimes seeing better latency when I'm not pinning to the CPU course. And I was not I was absolutely not expecting that. I and I I cannot explain it. <laughs> Either I'm measuring something completely wrong or um or there's something else going on. I don't know if any one of you has any ideas, except for measurement mistake, <laughs> that um that could lead um, to that. So when you run Beehive, normally without any pinning, you have a wider spread of late in your latency distribution, but confusingly, some of it is better than the pinned one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. Okay. I can show the you something. thing which could happen is that uh, threads which, depending on how you pin, 
now have to share a CPU like the IO thread and a virtual uh, CPU thread code without pinning be allowed to uh, get re, uh, okay. distributed among multiple host CPUs so that you have less uh, congestion on a specific host CPU core. Uh, put in let, me, let, me, let me ask could... a follow-up question, if, if that's all right. Um, Please. How would you how would you pin to the different cores? What what would be what would be your preferred method to pinning? Because right now I just you know pin sequentially. I said zero zero one one two two three three and so on. Are you running on your test system multiple beehive guests during the benchmarks, or a single during beehive guest? No, just just one beehive instance, and I'm not touching the system intentionally. Otherwise, so. I haven't tested all at all, but when I tested it, I only pinned the vCPU uh, threads, and I found that they got slightly better uh, um, latency and noticeably lower jitter by changing the host default CPU set so that I had basically most CPU cores on the systems unloaded completely from the host system. Uh, I left the host system to use the lowest uh, quarter of the CPU cores. Uh, okay, hold on a second. Let me, let, me, let me ask a follow-up question. Quarters are then uh, allocated sequentially to Beehive guests. So you're not doing this with Beehive-P, but you're doing this no, with, I don't know, CPU I, set. I'm, doing, I'm using CPU set to make sure set, that okay. the host CPU or logical CPU, so potentially hyperthread, um, is completely unloaded, so that every right. time this guest, uh, so I'm basically when I did this testing, I wanted to get rid of as much jitter as possible. So each vCPU course, yeah. was dedicated, uh, was basically pinned to one host CPU, and they make sure that nothing else was running on that host mm -hmm. CPU. Uh, so that uh, any time that guest becomes vulnerable, it is in an empty run queue. Plus minus maybe an interrupt or two. I did, but normally what I found that there is not much interrupt load on um, these calls. So it was enough to uh, move the user space set, but there is a Default kernel CPU set for the kernel processes slash threads, so that mm. you can mess with that. But if you do that, I think there could be downsides where you start things, or I don't know if the kernel lets you, but if it truly observes that on a big enough system, which is a true NUMA system, you could really hurt your system throughput if you prohibit the kernel from uh, Servicing, for example, uh, interrupt threads on the same NUMA domain as the uh, device. Mm. So let's say you have a 100 gig Ethernet card on your attached to the PCI root complex of your second CPU, and you only uh, left uh, CPU cores on the first socket to your uh, host, and now you try to do packet processing. Now all the packets, like 10 gigabytes or more per second at line rate, have to go through the inter-socket uh, bandwidth channel, which is already uh, probably staffed in such a system then. Hmm. Okay, back to um, Chris's questions. Uh, and yeah, let's so punch I, have, I, have, I have another, another curiosity. Um, and before I share the curiosity, I need to update a statement that I made previously. I uh, previously uh, remarked that my tests weren't showing better performance with NVMe. I need to revise that statement because after our last call, I figured, um, of course, I need to disable hyper-threading. I did that, and now I'm getting better performance with NVMe, also with a FreeBSD guest. And the curiosity I'm I stumbled across was Vertio Block 
performs better than NVMe for a single cross, a single thread load, then it performs better. However, what is also quite curious, in my opinion, is that VertIO block on a single uh, process across the different kinds of tests that I ran showed quite a lot of variance in terms of uh, in terms of uh, performance IOPS, IOPS basically. Um, For all the different kinds of disks and tests that I ran, um, IAPS was really like quite consistent across the board. But the more processes, the more parallel process I ran, of, of course, there was some you know minimum and maximum extrema. But at the end, it was still reasonably consistent. But with vertigo block, for one process, one workload. There is variability, and I don't I don't understand how that how that can be because I would expect, particularly with one process, to be this to be even more consistent than than uh, than with uh, with multiple loads. And I I don't know if if you guys have any idea how that could happen. Uh, so you ha if you have a shared queue like that or block, uh, you can. Uh have congestion on the lock protecting that queue that couldn't reduce a lot of uh, if you have and good, very good throughput if you have few users and the, the moment that lock becomes contested someone has to block on it and yeah well the thing is the host of the guests are not doing anything else but running the guest and running the tests within the guest mm -hmm. Um, there is no other, or well, there are some other processes, but they are not accessing that medium that I'm using for the tests, right? I mean, it's a RAM disk that's just there, and FIO is running and touching that that RAM disk. And how did you implement the RAM disk? Yeah. How did you? And, there are a few ways. Um, and the uh, what's it called? MD config. So there's and, type, uh, what is it, malloc, and there's type. Type is malloc, uh, malloc. Okay, thank you. That's also a good question. Yes. Yeah, because what right was the other one? It's like uh, t either tempfs or something, but they're apparently one's faster and, than the other. So do try so both types. You have uh, malloc, which uses the kernel heap allocator. You have vnode, which is uh, backed by a file. So that's how you can turn any normal right. file into a right. disk, which means that you now can geom taste it. Then there is swap, which is kind of like malloc, but it's swappable and null is a bit sync. Um, the problem with malloc is that uh, it can uh, run the host kernel out of memory if you Okay, yes. okay. I managed to do months. this actually. <laughs> oh, cool. I managed to do this on one. another host, uh, and yes, uh, that was I. I I I um I had to upgrade the system. I put an additional DIM in. <laughs> I actually run with this. When you're using the malloc, are you doing the dash o reserved? That forces an oh, I, I'm not doing that. You should. Yeah. If you want okay. consistent Good results point. twice. Okay. Otherwise, you're trying yeah, okay. to dynamically point. allocate that RAM disk as you're running. And who knows what node that's getting done on, because that's a kernel thread. Very good point. Yep. And so Thank unless you, you pin the kernel out, right. have you? Okay. And the other thing is, have you. have you done CPU set so that you have a completely isolated set of CPUs that are being used for the host and kernel stuff versus the, the CPUs that are being used to run the beehive stuff? Unfortunately, I did not. Yeah, Jan pointed out that also that uh, you need to have those that two is something I need to fix. I um, thank you. It's a very uh, good otherwise, point. is what can happen is a kernel thread or another process thread can run on the same CPU that you think you have, even though you pin Beehive to that CPU, you haven't stopped somebody else from running on that CPU. Pinning does not exclude other people. 
So what happens in the case Rod describes mm -hmm. is that potentially the guest kernel has a spin lock around something which should take a few dozen CPU cycles, and suddenly you get descheduled and wait in the scheduler queue for a tick or more, which means what should have taken nanoseconds to microseconds now takes milliseconds, yeah. which is three or more orders of magnitude more, which is enough to trigger pathological behaviors in spin locks, which is why some kernels implement adaptive locks, even within the kernel when they assume that they're not running on bare metal. But that's more than enough to explain uh, variations. The question I have, has anyone looked into using CPU set or uh, similar tools uh, to um, pin the non-vCPU beehive uh, threads, like the device emulation threads or the main event loop? And if so, how would one go about that? And would it even make sense to try it? Or is it best to just let that because it's basically I.O., so it should run as scheduled by the host kernel as it normally would. Right. Uh, anyone else? I don't, I don't know that you can segregate those because isn't all the pinning stuff based upon PID so that you can't? And that thread is just part of the same, that's a thread in the beehive PID. So I don't, um, think, I don't think you could, there's any mechanism. It would be interesting to be able to do that, but I don't think there is any mechanism in place to say, run this thread of this PID on a separate CPU. Yeah, which comes um, first, the PIN or the PID? Uh, well, sorry, the that question doesn't make sense to me. No, but you, you're you trying to, you know, what's the so first the CPU step in... set decides which threads, unless you're a super user and can extend your set, mm -hmm. uh, of, of CPUs you can potentially be scheduled on. Then you can decide from among those to voluntarily pin yourself to only get scheduled on a specific CPU in your set. Uh, I don't know what happens if you try to set your affinity to a CPU which isn't part of your CPU set. I guess it either gets ignored or you get scheduled whenever that becomes part of your CPU set and you've effectively uh, deadlocked yourself. Uh, I don't know. But I think there's a system call where you can set the CPU set per thread and not per task. That's why I asked. So Chris, your homework grows every single time you mention this and I, I, you're doing great work and it's long overdue because the fundamental resources are there, but uh, I have not seen extensive analyses of CPU pinning relating to every aspect of a VM and the host. So the thing is, what prevents us from using uh, CPU pinning uh, easily in production, if you prepare to dedicate the host to only VM hosting even, is that there's no helper to have, help you pick the next set or to form a good set where you say, I want to run a guest with eight virtual CPUs on one socket, find me the best available fit and pin it. You can, the information can be queried, but there's the a reservation helper for Beehive so that different Beehive uh, processes can be started in an arbitrary order and then have basically the helper create a CPU set and tell them, yeah, use that. I make sure that everything is locked correctly and I created non-overlapping sets. Or you could pre-reserve a set and then intentionally share that if you wanted that, if you wanted to delegate a certain capacity 
uh, let's say you have a tenant and you dedicate them 16 host CPU cores to do with as they please, and then they can partition that among the virtual machines. If you wanted to implement something like that, that would be possible on the CPU set uh, in command line, but right now you have to do the math in your ha ha head or in a shell script. And having to write your own shell script to run under log F or re execute itself under log F uh, as required isn't a good interface to uh, expect users to utilize. It's just a problem of, yeah, there is a mechanism, there is nothing to use the mechanism in place, which does not require developing your own code. Okay, I just looked at the syscall man page for CPC, CPU set and CPU set, set ID, currently CPU, which PID is the only acceptable value for which as threads do not have an ID distinct from their process and the API does not permit changing the ID of an existing set. So you cannot set affinity per okay. thread. It's only the granularity currently. It doesn't, there's a, you can, the mechanisms are there. It's just that it's, there's not an implementation that allows it per thread. So it's uh, the CPU set, but the affinity you can set per thread. EP set set ID. Can you paste that link or text in the chat, please, or document? Um, Pretty please. Or name it, whatever works. It's man page uh, yep. for man two. Ah, we just report what we call it. Man two CPU set. Thank you. Yeah, the CPU set is per process. Okay. But the Thread uh, CPU affinity is per thread. It's in the oh, portable oh, part. Set affinity. Gotcha. Interesting. That's the voluntary part. Whereas CPU set is mandatory, forced upon the thread by the corner. A thread can specify an affinity where it wants to be scheduled, and the host will not schedule it anywhere else when it has granted this. And you can only effectively uh, set your affinity to something from inside your CPU set. I do not know the semantics of what happens when you try to uh, limit your affinity set to something which is not part of your mandatory set. If that gets refused, if you block until your mandatory uh, set changes, or if it just gets ignored, I haven't tried. Or if something stupid happens instead. Oh, there's a deadlock warning, so it does not allow you to uh, specify uh, <clears throat> with, an, with an anonymous mask. Okay. So you cannot uh, request the kernel to deadlock you. It will refuse a request. Oh, somebody submit a bug report and get that fixed. What? <laughs> but you cannot. Oh, okay. You're joking. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I, come on. Policy not. Not. I mean, if no, I want no, to deadlock a... myself, I should be allowed to deadlock myself, right? No, you shouldn't because you can't recover. And you can't even be send a uh, signal to unbreak yourself, which what happens if you have sent you a sick uh, kill and you're not vulnerable to run the signal handling cleanup code? Yeah. Um, okay, for sick kill, maybe not, but yeah, it's not a good idea. To allow that it's good that it's not possible to request that. You, I don't know, maybe you can force it into that state by changing the CPU set after the affinity is in place. If you really want to have a foot gun, you have enough. <laughs> But as far as I know, uh, the the vCPU thread pinning is done via the thread affinity, not the CPU set. 
but you could create a CPU set, for example, which is one or two CPUs more than the affinity one, then have, I would probably have to patch Beehive to set the affinity of all the remain the default affinity beforehand to not the ones reserved and then have a little pool of CPUs for the IO per guest. Or it's good enough that it is unpinned and it it's not worth the effort to pin that and someone found that out. And that's why it's not implemented, but it's not documented why something isn't possible. As often negatives aren't documented. Chris, you got a rabbit hole for Easter. Any other questions? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, yes. um, as I stated here, I'm I'm wondering um, how long should I run a test right now? We're running for sixty seconds. Like each storage each benchmarks. The different... Yes. Um, Until exactly. uh, doubling it again and again uh, doesn't uh, change the um, distribution anymore, <laughs> or you notice that there is no point where you get reasonably uh, close distribution, and then you have to look at your percentiles and if it it's too noisy. You just have to say, yeah, it is noisy. There is no steady state I can neatly analyze. Hmm. Good answer. Um, or you just, because it's running a <clears throat> test in bound memory, you just leave it running continuously uh, in such a way that it, if possible, doesn't even have uh, breaks in the workload. When you have a neat power virus, but you can also have a good state to uh, use D-trace in to have a repeatable workload which mm -hmm. exercises the system to point out. just the way you want. I need to point out to understand. Yeah, oh, that remember, remember, I'm, I'm testing. I'm testing all sorts of various combinations. So basically, what um, I'm doing is. I um I configure I configure the uh, the guest with a partic particular uh, storage backend. Uh, let's say a vert IO block, then it boots, then it runs the test for sixty seconds, saves the data, shuts down, and does the same thing again for NVMe, for a HCI, uh, and so on and so forth. And basically, in the different kind of variations with CPU pinning, no CPU pinning, uh, one workload multiple workloads as many as the vcpu would double the vcpu count and so on and so forth so that's my whole set as i have it right now um already takes probably around four to six hours to run because Whoa. of the different okay. variations so um and, and and that is already the time because even if i you know the time if i double that it's gonna take days to complete yeah in that case, maybe you have to narrow down your test of cases. Exactly. Hence exactly. his next question. Do we do um, read, write, read yes. random? Yeah. So Let's next see where question you're on my side would be with uh, NVMe, did you play with the max Q and Q size settings? No, I have not. But again, because, uh, <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna that's where you get the potential for massive concurrency gains. Mm -hmm. Because uh, one of the things which is fundamentally different between NVMe and uh, SCSI or SATA as a poor man's SCSI these days is that um, with SCSI you have a single command and a single reply uh, to, and everything gets serialized to that. Uh, with uh, NVMe you have an administrative queue for the setup stuff and then the normal transfers happen over the non-administrative queues. And these are basically pairs of ring buffers and you can have as many as you have, for example, virtual CPUs, then each virtual CPU gets its own dedicated, uh, sorry, dedicated pair of queues, uh, which means that now you don't have any locking when you want to talk to the device, uh, which is, also very useful in hardware because now you save like three uh, I.O. 
memory mapped address accesses per QA operation compared to SATA and most HPAs. Um, so, yeah. Obviously, there's, there's definitely some tweaking and in performance improvements that we can, you know, extract from NVMe. Um, right now, I've focused on comparing the three different kinds of sets, AHCI, NVMe, and Virtio block to get an understanding which, how do they perform to each other. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at NVMe specifically, then we can, you know, dig into the different kind of parameters and how they affect the performance that uh, rabbit hole, so to say. Um, and I mean, one of the mm -hmm. learnings that I've extracted at the moment is that um, that um, with Virtio Block, I'm, I'm definitely seeing noticeably, noticeably better, no, sorry, worse, worse performance um, between read and writes. So let's say write performs worse than read. Um, and that seems to be happening across the board, no matter how many workloads I run. With NVMe, I get consistent performance, no matter whether it's a read and write, which I also find quite intriguing. Um, Ramdesk, uh, that is what I would have assumed that reads and writes are about the same speed. Right, but wouldn't you expect it also for for where they will block? You're doing Rod's work. Are your lab notes available anywhere? Because we could go um, on weeks for with sorry, each little I, variation here. I would here. expect that for a RAM disk backing uh, storage, no matter how right. you access it. Hmm. So, but for a SSD, I would expect reads to be faster than writes because oh, for sorry, most doc, um, SSDs, if you look into the data sheet, despite how optimistic they are, they are at least consistent that almost any SSD is, has better read than write performance. I agree. The thing is you can, you can seriously see that there is a, that there's a difference for Virtio block between reads and between writes. Hmm. Are those lab notes can, somewhere? If, you, if you're if you're interested, if you're interested, I can I can um, I can share my screen your, off uh, recording if you like. Yeah. Sure, let's have a look at it later. Because to state the obvious, everyone present has different hardware from you, and we can run your tests if they're easy to access and get back to you. That and uh, the other questions I would have to you is, did you dig through your uh, what passes for a BIOS these days uh, to make sure that automatic frequency uh, control and so on is off and you're not anywhere close to running into thermal throttling? So that uh, you have even a chance at a, consistent yeah. CPU speed on a modern system. I need to check that. I need to check that. Because otherwise you're effectively measuring how the how many CPUs are not too hot and how many CPUs are idle enough that they count as idle from the, for the hardware because depending on the exact hardware, you normally per computer, one or two CPUs or threads can boost only to full speed. And then uh, only if not, uh, none of the neighboring ones are awake enough to count as active. And then on actual hardware, it's also that not all CPU cores can turbo to the same uh, speed. So, you, for example, with recent-ish AMD CPUs, you have a uh, per compute uh, cluster, CCX, you have uh, the best two cores uh, in a way which uh, at least Windows can uh, inspect at runtime available. And then basically the scheduler is supposed to make sure that it loads those two first. People have been in the Linux world, been experimenting with crazy ideas, which have interesting payoffs where uh, they 
intentionally migrate workloads uh, every few hundred milliseconds so that basically you move your workload through the die so that you have a, a heat load going in circles so that no core has time to really heat up. You run it for half a second or so and then at full turbo and then you go to the next core basically uh, in a pattern. Oh, good Lord, pre-warming your cores. Oh boy. No, okay. uh, <laughs> the other way around, uh, making sure that you can take advantage of the full uh, basically heat distribution capacity of your heat spreader and not are not limited uh, oh, in a Lord. laptop, for example, by a single hotspot so that your fan now has to spin up to allow you to keep that single hotspot under control. Instead, you move the work around so that uh, you move the workload and thereby there is no uh, persistent hotspot which overheats a part of the die and thereby either forces the system to run until it has to emergency throttle itself to stop damage or uh, until more realistic and less pathological the fans spin up and the laptop is annoying and loud because if the laptop then can run all of its right now, existing cores. Right um, I'm I'm running intentionally on a workstation, not on a not on a notebook. But uh, the Intel is a notebook, so um, the points you're making are absolutely valid, and I have to check that out, particularly for the notebook. Yeah. And even on a workstation uh, chip, you have the same boosting behavior, just with vastly higher uh, power limits. The mechanisms are basically the same, just less well tuned, uh, on a, even on a good system. Um, the point of a high speed desktop or workstation CPU is, is that you run it far beyond the point of diminishing returns when it comes to throughput per watt to get good single thread throughput on a reasonable number of cores for most affordable workstations. Hmm. So and there you go, Chris. That's something FreeBSD does well, but yeah. uh, FreeBSD is not smart enough uh, because there is no uh, topology aware on and power aware scheduling in the way which is required to do that. That it really makes sure that it will not rake up the unloaded cores sporadically because if it does not put them into a thing, it's a C3 or lower then uh, the core counts as active and prevents the other cores in most of these implementations uh, from uh, boosting to its full performance uh, potential for a single one. And yeah, so you kind of have to change away the CPU uh, scheduler work from trying to have reason be the best proof put with reasonable overhead on an idealized n core system with this cache topology, which is what FreeBSD does, to yes, do a little bit more on the scheduler, yes, do a bit less, uh, do a little worse theoretically, but in the real world, do better because now you're respecting the documented uh, hardware properties. And yeah, it's an open configuration mess in uh, Linux. It, more or less works supposedly uh, in Windows for gaming workloads up to like 16 or so cores. And after that, it all breaks down and uh, you have to figure it out. And yeah, so far FreeBSD doesn't do any of that. And especially on a uh, medium aged Intel laptop, that's a big problem because uh, if you use all four or eight cores on them, you do not get the full performance in a single thread, which means for things like scrolling in your YouTube tab, uh, that you do not get the best response times because the CPU is running 500 or more megahertz below its full boost because from the boost behaviors point of view, uh, all cores are active uh, and you have four cores with hyper-threading when in reality only one hyper-thread is really loaded and that's the one running the browser bloatware. Um, and 
you can't boost to full speed because it's, yeah, the scheduler doesn't know to keep the l not really loaded cores deep asleep and move the workload over to the active core. And basically, you could maybe get a poor man's implementation of that by dynamically changing a shared CPU set so that you would, basically, when you do something similar to what PowerD++ does for speed, so that you would kind of look at the load per CPU, and then if the cores are fully loaded for, for a, let's say, whatever, 10 or 20 milliseconds, then you uh, spit, double the size of the CPU set. I look um, forward to your proof of concept of that. Anything yeah, else to wrap up the... performance uh, testing and benchmarking and the rabbit hole related to it? Really? Just what it is? Chris, you're doing great. I love it. Keep us posted. And if you have lab notes or scripts to try, let it rip. And then we'll soon have uh, ARM64 to just throw all of that out the window and <laughs> have, have a completely new view of the world. Anything else? And Daniel, do you have uh, topics or questions? I see you've had to come and go a few times. Yeah, I think I, I, think I missed the boat. I was uh, lugging a, uh, well, Beehive server all over, <laughs> As one all does. over Manhattan. That, As one does. As one does, um, yes. Yeah, I was. I was CPU more... set in the city. Bad New York joke. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, one thing that I was I, I wanted to bring up though, and I might be late to late to do so. I, I wanted to. Um, I don't know. I think it would be. I think it would be interesting to create a hypervisor system that uh, you know that would that could fail over or sort of be operating system agnostic. So, in other words. Uh, failover from FreeBSD to OmniOS or, you know, or, or something, something like that. So I wanted to start experimenting with that. And I, I mean, I've, I've, I've taken AWS machines out and run them in beehives and vice versa. So I'm not super concerned that I'm going to run into any problems, but I was just thinking I could uh, ask the experts, uh, you know, what do you think? Any, any issues I could potentially run into there? If I if I expected to sort of swap back between um, hypervisors or OSs at least, um, you know, kind um, of frequently. Well, the thing is, yeah, some hypervisors encourage you to integrate with them. For example, with QEMU, you can have it preload the Linux kernel for you, uh, and then reduce boot times by having basically QEMU similar to Beehive load, but in a single process module, mm. load a specific kernel, uh, which may then have some customizations or whatever. And if you ever get into this workload there, you integrate too deeply with your hypervisor, you can suddenly no longer do a virtual to physical or virtual to other virtual migration easily. Uh, or if you're thought. afraid of your... Uh, or if the hypervisor comes with a customized distro image so that you are not installing, let's say Ubuntu server as you would do it on a physical bare metal system, but now you have a customized image which integrates with the hypervisor and guest agent and so on. And, and it can, then it starts to break down when you try to move that or it doesn't boot because the kernel you have only knows how to uh, deal with the dozen or so uh, power virtualized drivers uh, that hypervisor uh, expects you to see because it can provide them to you. Uh, to uh, And if you go down that road, you can't get off it easily and it becomes an annoying integration hurdle. So I would say uh, treat any hypervisor as far as possible as a 
virtual machine as in close enough to a g generic uh, white box PC that we're running with the current defaults of UEFI boot uh, and whatever storage you want and a default distribution kernel and so on, it, you would have a good chance that if you took a raw dump of your disk and put it on a USB SSD and plugged it into a, a random laptop that it would boot at least far enough to present an error message that the network is unavailable and that it doesn't know how to get GPU acceleration or something. Right. Right, um, those would be the yeah, those would be the to edge. Use something that's... like Firecracker, or as an extreme example, which is deeply tied to trying to remove as much as possible from the uh, boot time and legacy crap uh, AMD sixty four has settled with from the last forty years or so of mm -hmm. history. Uh, Basically, your C the first setting of a CPU booting is basically a time machine reliving four decades in four seconds. Um, right. And it goes through all the legacy. But as we can see with Beehive, it doesn't have to be too bad. Uh, we're talking about milliseconds, not seconds, uh, of uh, overhead. So why not? keep your guests as vanilla and uncustomized as possible so that you treat them as you would with the uh, cheap PC with no uh, out of band management and you just happen to have uh, access to the system console like you would on your home lap laptop or something and you try to then build on top of that and say, yeah, okay, let's use SSH instead of uh, Lip veered with QEMO agent running to get a console. Mm -hmm. So, oh. uh, so that or spice or whatever, and don't use that. Just make sure that you can get into it through the system console. Make sure that the serial and, if available, the video console are just configured as activated consoles. Uh, and then if you have a busy the distribution or operating system of your choice running, just try it that it's not tied to anything too specific that uh, can come up on different systems. One quick Does that point. Make sense? Go ahead. Yeah. So on FreeBSD, for example, with just unloading the right kernel modules and loading the other one, you could, for example, test both Beehive and VirtualBox. Uh, with a bit more uh, suffering, you could also try uh, Zen uh, without ever having to leave the uh, FreeBSD. Uh, you know, then if you just wanted to check for correctness, I think you should be able to use unaccelerated emulated uh, QEMO, which would at least get you to boot something, even if it would be slow. And right, yeah. Then you, uh, Need a Linux box to test the same hypervisors there, so especially QEMO. But if you are coming off VMware, for example, right now, you take your VMware system, guest system and look at them. And then oftentimes for Beehive, it's find the right two or five or whatever knobs to set to the right setting so that it looks compatible. And yeah, for example, use SATA even if it has less than optimal performance. Uh, use the E1000 NIC emulation for Windows and SATA because then you don't have to have uh, BitIO drivers to boot. So that at least right. your boot configuration or your install configuration, you emulate the devices and not uh, rely on proper power virtualized drivers. Right. I think that some edge cases I'm only going to know about once I see them. Like, who knows which which cloud providers have NVMe support or, you and know, and the problem is that support. especially cloud providers, uh, both the big and the small want you to uh, stay within their platform and they have often heavily customized images. They 
yeah. recommend to you. You can, on any reasonable one, you can put your own images, which just happen to be, if you want to, them to be uh, the default distribution images if they're not available uh, in their image repository. Uh, mm -hmm. But for you may find that, for example, cloud in it is pre-installed and they expect their guest, if it claims to be this set of operating systems to have their patched version of this operating system in there with their with everything in cloud in it enabled and so on. So that for example, through their web interface, you can change the IP address on the virtual interface through the uh, through cloud in it or the QM or guest agent, whatever they're using for that. Right. Uh, these kinds of things, it's annoying and it will, you will notice it if you try it. Oh, Daniel, do Does you have two specific providers you want to go between? Are we talking Beehive on Illumos and FreeBSD or KVM or what? Because I found that as simple as like, hey, can I just have raw image support, please, pretty please? But that's a challenge on, say, VMware and others. Yeah, though I have had I have had success with that before. Because mm -hmm. um, you can sit there like converting a, all the time. It's like, eh, yeah. <laughs> Well, no, you can do. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, you can do. You can do VMware with a with a Zvol back. It's mm -hmm. it, it. I mean, of, of course. I mean, it's just bits. So, but yeah, I was I was thinking about doing. So I was I was sort of imagining, and maybe this is just a thought experiment, but I was imagining sort of the way, uh, you know, the way the top level domain servers are. You know, one is one is Linux, one is FreeBSD, one is you know, bind and one is uh, whichever other one it is, and then different versions staggering. So, like if you if you're in a serious heavy compliance environment now, maybe this is this is enterprise. This is like something that like Meta would be interested in. It's probably not something that you know <laughs> that that the companies that I deal with would ever possibly care about that level of of sort of resilience. But but just the idea. That okay, this operating system has the bug of the century on it, and now I can, you know, I can I can jump off, and I have an I've an I have an exit plan that I can get to in the next twenty four hours, because the because the system is already tuned with all the expected drivers and so on. Hey, um, yeah. So that's what I was that's what I was thinking. That's a good point, and I'm. My vote of the hour is simply Illumos. They do so much well and we have so much overlap. Just talk to the entrenigs of the world about that. And uh, yeah, it's kind of one of the shortest paths available to us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It's, I, I, I do, I do like that idea. It also means that, you know, Hey, I need containers once in a while. Maybe I have a Linux box or, Hey, this these zones things uh, things I really need to get my hands dirty with them, and uh, you know, and I don't I wouldn't have to interrupt my infrastructure too much. Yep. By I mean, certainly Illumos Beehive. That probably I I can't imagine ZFS be any cough like hello. Yeah. You know, that's where the first well, class yeah. ZFS support is anywhere on the planet. Yeah, not not exactly the same open ZFS that we're used to, but very, very close. Um close cousins, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Siblings even. But um yeah, anyway, just a just just a thought and something that I actually probably will be doing um in, in the real world. So yeah. Hey, if someone will pay so anyway. you twice, that's like awesome. <laughs> like, By right. the way, um when it comes to uh, Beehive and virtualizing desktop workers, I have forgotten his name, but at EuroBSDCon 2019, someone had an impressive example of a slightly patched Beehive, which was able to use uh, the laptop's uh, Intel GPU with uh, GVT uh, something. Like so, Corbin Cohn's work? No, not... Uh, someone else before he was working on it, I think. Yeah, Jan uh, was the, doing that to some degree. I think he was working Michael. on getting uh, NVIDIA and 
NVIDIA and uh, AMD working. Mm -hmm. But they might, this was only for the uh, integrated GPUs, but you could, could get like 80% of native performance with Windows 10 running uh, as a guest. Uh, and because it was uh, the medium sized uh, Intel IGPUs can be partitioned in such a way and are not feature gated yep. so that you can treat them kind of like a, yeah, a quadro card or something, or yep. so that you can uh, have a video on those and then just have a headless accelerated guest driver and pass through that virtual function device. I required some minimal changes, isn't that correct? Uh, it's the first time I stumbled across that was shortly before the conference on uh, Twitter at the time, but it was working. And um, the thing is that it would get you, for example, an accelerated guest uh, video, uh, which could then be accessed through, uh, yeah, for example, a VNC running inside the guest, but it would use the passed to GPU to run the ridiculous desktop shadow effects and stuff and transparency. Yeah. yeah. So I need that. Mm -hmm. I do actually, I do actually need that because nope. uh you know for for remote desktop. Uh I I sell, you know, a small a small a small a small number for security purposes. So I put Fudo in front of that uh Pal Davidex brilliant uh um a jump host system in front of uh you know rdp boxes so yeah i do i do need nice. fancy shadow effects <laughs> uh well, wish you could easily disable them by default but hey um the shadow effect that is on windows uh but <laughs> i do want a snap user interface and there's a difference if you have a purely virtual system or if you have uh, the Windows internal RDP server running on a system with a GPU, because then it will use the GPU to pre-compute the video and just send it via RDP. Right. Yeah, it does. It it seems like it's not an enormous problem that it doesn't um, to, to it do without. It depends on the resolution. But... If you need a 60 FPS, 4K, that's different than full HD or less, uh, 16 bit color depth, already something effectively is, uh, frames per second latency. Um, yeah. Hey, team, I got it. You can just get out of the box with RDP. Uh, and I found that, yeah, it's annoying to set up, but you can use uh, the present a VNC server to set up your little Windows pad, your LDH mm -hmm. pad, and then uh, turn on RDP and access uh, with reasonable performance. And the full integration you get the moment you turn on RDP on a Windows uh, desktop. Um, but sure, it's limited what you get out of an unaccelerated RDP on a virtual machine. So right. don't expect miracles there, but also don't expect it to be as bad as VNC is. Yeah, for sure. Because the nice thing which kind of surprised me is that you do actually get usable virtual uh, audio devices and so on so that you can even play sound effects and get annoying pop-up notifications from the virtual machine. At least with the official uh, RDP client for Mac OS or Windows. Yeah. Microsoft. Well, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. I have to go back into the whirring, screaming fans of the uh, of the IT closet here. So oh, I'll, I'll talk to you guys next you. week. Take care of yourself. You too. Talk to you soon. Bye. So, Chris, is your audio still working? Okay, you two. Yes. Do you two want to continue in perhaps my absence? 
Chris wants to have someone look over um, his I can, uh, test um, cases. I can I spend can... a couple more minutes, but I need to. Yeah, I can. I, I need to leave it like half. Um, but I can. Uh, I can share the. Um, I can share the measurements uh, that I've I've done. Off yeah, recording. That'd be great. Please do sure. if you have uh, your both your results and your scripts. If you can share them. I, yeah, because... I don't have the scripts ready. Um, the thing is, it's kind of it's kind of all you know wrapped into something with a virtual machine. I don't have it set up that it just you know um, fills the virtual machine with the scripts. So there there's some manual labor included in that basically. But um, yeah. I think it is still something that I could put up. Um, yeah. I mean, sounds like something you should be able to do with. Uh... Either Ansible or a bunch of make and shell files. I completely agree. Uh, yeah, I just you know focused my work on the analysis Getting... part more than on the actual um, on the actual you know automation. But if you can't reproduce the numbers, you uh, get an unreproducible paper at best. The thing is, I can reproduce if I use the virtual machine image that I have, because that's what I'm going to transport back and forth also. Sure, if you can share that one. Yes, probably. It's like um, like a, yeah. a gig download. Yeah, that, that should be possible, actually. Just, I know, but you're not getting usable numbers. I'm sure he so will. He's... It sounds like you're stuck at looking at the numbers Austrian. and there's too much noise in the signal to come to any conclusion right now, if I understood your general trend. On that note, we have a new host, and I encourage you to like and subscribe. Thank you, too. You can continue. I must run. Thank you.